Hi guys, if you're new here, I'm Jennifer. I read around 110 books last year and these are my favorite 15 going loosely in order up to absolute favorites. Also, I realized I haven't done a Q&A in years. So if you have any questions for me about reading, publishing, general life things, you can leave them in the comments here or DM me on Twitter and I'll make a video. I say this every year that this isn't a best list, it's a true favorites list. And it's even more important for me to clarify this time around because the first book to mention is Pericles by William Shakespeare-ish. There's evidence to suggest the first two acts were probably written by a man named George Wilkins and possibly Shakespeare wrote the other three. Regardless of provenance, this play is awful. It is the worst Shakespeare I've encountered. The speeches from the prologue chorus character are wooden. There's no point in me attempting to describe the plot because it changes every scene. It's like if a group of high school students studying Shakespeare were assigned, you know, write your own play as a group project and some of them took it really seriously, some of them were trolly, some were high, like, this would be the result. I gotta say though, I thoroughly enjoyed this play. I rolled around in the trash heap. Usually I audiobook Shakespeare while following along with free text online and listen to, you know, maybe one act a day. I started Pericles late at night and couldn't stop listening. It has that real pure suspense of what's going to happen next. It could be anything. And there's something shamefully entrancing about watching a talented person fail. It's like, I don't know if Michelangelo painted smiley faces or Beyonce had laryngitis. We move on to some quality now to Wasted Morning by Gabriela Adamasceanu, translated from Romanian by Patrick Miller. This novel was first published in Romania in 1984 and, and was an instant hit, but the English edition was only published in 2011 and we were missing out. We need to make up for lost time. This starts with a gossipy old woman named Vika. She always has to go see other people because nobody comes to see her anymore. But on this particular morning, um, her two chosen visits aren't going well and she starts to question the decision to leave her house. We've all been there. And from her, we move on to other voices and other potentially wasted mornings, going all the way back to 1916 on the eve of Romania's entry into the Great War. If you love the type of book with perspective shifts where you're constantly seeing characters in a new light and being forced to question your earlier judgments, this is for you. The gap between how we see ourselves and how others perceive us is fascinating, isn't it? And Adam Ashanu works that dynamic perfectly. And there's also a, a leisurely, almost hushed, quality to this novel. I savored it over the course of, I think, about a month. Um, now, I will say there is a section toward the middle that drags. Even quiet books have energy to them, and this lost that for a bit, which is why it's not higher up the list, but still a completely uh, overlooked and excellent book for me. Book number 13 is When He Was Wicked by Julia Quinn. This is number six of eight in the Bridgerton Regency Romance series. I've read all of them um, and might make a, a video on the full series if you're interested. But um, Francesca Bridgerton is the sibling who appears the least in the other titles, so she's a bit of an enigma. And this starts when she's 22 and her loving young husband dies suddenly. Her husband's cousin, Michael, was really more of a, a brother to him and one of her best friends as well. But unbeknownst to Francesca, Michael, the notorious rake, has been in love with her since they first met. Um, and despite the sensational nature of a lot of it, uh, there's something a little more intense about this one compared to the rest of the series, a little more substantive, which isn't always preferable in this genre, but Quinn pulls it off here. And uh, straight up, When He Was Wicked has the best sex scenes of the Bridgerton books, by which I mean the least boring. Next is What Are You Going Through by Sigrid Nunez. I was sent this review copy by Riverhead and a little personal context is useful for this one because um, so someone I was close to died in the fall of last year. I was with them in their final days and this is what I was reading during that time. Loosely speaking, it's about a middle-aged woman whose longtime friend is dying and that friend asks her for an enormous favor. 
And the novel is also a compilation of many stories because the narrator is reporting speech in the way we all do. We pick up you know, fragments from books and movies, conversations we've overheard, stories we were told by people who were also told those stories without having lived them. There's this effortless wisdom to Nunez's writing. I, I love the wavelength she's on in, in both this and her other most recent novel, The Friend. They just feel right to the core. And the fact that I could read at all during that time, um, let alone a book about death, I, I think speaks to its emotional integrity. Sorry to give you whiplash there, jumping from vanilla Regency romance sex to death, the two poles of life. Uh, things get more even keeled from here on out. Um, so last of this first quad is How I Came to Know Fish by Ota Pavel. And this is translated from Czech by Robert McDowell and Jindruska Bottle. It's gotta be in Trishka, right? They don't have the markings there. Anyway, this is a simple, charming memoir about the author's childhood in Czechoslovakia leading up to and including World War II. Pavel focuses a lot on his father, who was a Czech Jew and proud of both aspects of that identity. There's something blithely, deceptively matter-of-fact about how Pavel recounts these memories because the cumulative effect of them is so moving. In the epilogue, he describes being institutionalized for several harrowing years and then goes on to say, when I felt better, I tried to remember what had been beautiful in my life. I did not think about love or how I had wandered all over the world. I remembered walking along the brooks, rivers, ponds, and dams to fish. I realized that these were the most beautiful experiences in my life. Why? I cannot explain it exactly, but I tried to come close to it in this book. Moving on to Fool's Assassin by Robin Hobb. I swear I don't reserve a yearly spot for her. I actually hadn't heard overwhelmingly positive things about this final trilogy in the Realm of the Elderling series. Um, but this first book of that Fits in the Fool trilogy was another reminder of why her brand of character-driven epic fantasy works for me. As with all of his volumes, Fitz narrates this, but for the first time in seven books, another narrator is also included in a Fitz book. And I resented the idea of that going in um, and then came to love the second narrator and the way that their voice and perspective both complements and contradicts Fitz's. The only reason I haven't gone on to book two yet is that terrible things always happen to the characters you care about in Robin Hobb's books. I mean, not gratuitously, but still gruesomely. You know, really bad things were already set in motion at the end of Fool's Assassin, and um, part of me doesn't want to go through that right now. But like I said, Hobb handles the hurting well, so I should push through. What are we on? Is this is book number nine. Um, this is Passing by Nala Larson. I'm planning a classic and contemporary pairing video on this with The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which I also enjoyed, but this is the one that got under my skin. No questionable phrasing intended. It was published in 1929 and recounts the fateful reunion of childhood friends Irene Redfield and Claire Kendry, both of whom are black but can pass for white. Uh, so Irene marries a black man, but Claire marries a white man and it passes over. This book is so clever and tricksy in its use of imagery, of perception and invisibility, its language about borders and suppression and the boundaries of self and communal identity. There's a sustained tautness to the writing that's combined with frank reflections on race. I mean, passing is a, a definite Harlem Renaissance gem. Back to nonfiction with Border, A Journey to the Edge of Europe by Kapka Kasabova, who's originally from Bulgaria. Her family moved to New Zealand when she was a teenager and she now lives in Scotland. Kasabova is also a novelist, but this was her returning to her childhood home to explore the borderland shared by Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece. And as you go through sections of the book dedicated to observations in each country, it becomes more and more evident how difficult it is to section off these things. You can't mimic the stark drawing of a line on a map when you're talking about people with a you know, mixes of homelands and nationalities, languages, religions, ethnicities, and how all these things don't fit into the neat categories into which modern nation states want to stuff their citizens. It's um, 
an eerie book at times, but also filled with affection for the resilience of these places. We now dive into the depths of despair. This is Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin by Timothy Snyder. Um, the subtitle is doing a lot of work, but as I discussed in a longer video review, Snyder's entry point to this portion of 20th century history is geography. He sections off the area of Europe that proved deadliest from 1933 to 45. 14 million people in Eastern Europe were murdered in those years by the regimes of Stalin and Hitler from well-known events like um, the Holocaust death camps in Poland to the fairly well-recognized forced Ukrainian famine, the far less discussed collective traumas that occurred in places like Belarus and the Baltic states. Snyder shows the disparate experiences that fell under these umbrellas of terror. And he makes ideological ties and distinctions between Russia and Germany's killing strategies and goals, essentially. Obviously, a hard book to read in many respects, but there's a digestible quality to Snyder's writing that I'm more impressed with as time goes by and as a lot of the details of Bloodlands stay with me. Clearly, I'm passionate about every title in this video, but these top six are head and shoulders above everything else from last year. Some of them have been read by millions of people, um, one of them only by thousands, I would think, um, but they all deserve more readers. So. Number six of the Super Six is The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. My first James and his style here gelled with me, so I would appreciate further recommendations from his work, which I've heard is varied. This follows Isabel Archer, a young American on her first tour of Europe who has the it factor. Everyone finds her captivating, men propose at the drop of a hat, the world seems laid out at her feet, and it's a story about the fragility of promise and the waning sense that you know, if you are an extraordinary person, of course you'll go on to live an extraordinary life. All it takes is some bad luck mixed in with a little bad judgment to potentially disrupt your expectations. Beyond being an engrossing narrative, this is pretty much a, a masterclass in most Western literary techniques. Number five is Blue Nights by Joan Didion. Her earlier memoir, The Year of Magical Thinking, was about how her husband of many years died suddenly at their dinner table one night at the same time that their only child, their daughter Quintana, was in the hospital in serious condition. Didion compulsively wrote Year of Magical Thinking to chronicle that first year without her husband. Then, right before the publication of that book, her daughter died at the age of 39, and it took Didion several years to be able to write about her daughter's loss and the loss of being a parent, which are the, the main focus points of this book. Didion is famous for the precision of her writing, which she carries over into the year of magical thinking, and she tries to hold on to the vestiges of that precision in Blue Nights, but she can't really, not beyond the individual sentence level. This is a chaotic book. It's filled with evasions. You only learn about Quintana in snatches because you sense that each memory is costing Didion, but I don't know, in its own strange, detached way, this is like a howl of love. I'll leave a video linked below to Didion reading from some of my favorite parts of the, the opening section of Blue Nights. It's such a powerful video. I strongly recommend you watch it, even if you don't think you can make it through the memoir. I now have a cat making bread on my lap, so I'm sorry if you can hear that, but number four is The Masochist by Katia Perra, translated from Slovenian by Michael Biggins. I requested this from Eastros Books. They're a fantastic small press dedicated to translation from Southeastern Europe. And when I saw this in their fall 2020 catalog, it screamed my name. But, um, you know, you can never be sure if your taste radar is functioning until you've actually started reading. And after the first few pages of this, it felt like my veins were filling with bubble bath and I could just sink into it. This is a debut novel set in turn of the century Vienna following Nada, who's a fictionalized protagonist surrounded by figures like Freud, Klimt, and most notably her father, Leopold von Sacher Masoch, who inspired the term masochist in the risque sense of the word. And this is Nada's barbed observations about everyone and everything around her and all of their hypocrisies. Uh, this novel is so 
spry and witty, but there's also a dawning sense of self-discovery as Nada turns her talents on herself. Because if there's one thing we can count on, it's that we're all hypocrites. You know, the scene in Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth says, till this moment, I never knew myself. This has that quality to it. And in a way that's both fun and polished, especially given this is a debut. Now we come to what's undoubtedly the most original, thoughtful pick of the bunch, Homer's Iliad. It is so, so good. We interrupt your scheduled programming to bring you this breaking news. I read the Robert Fagel's translation, which I don't think will end up being my ride or die version of Homer, but was useful for a first reading um, because he emphasizes readability over poetry, I would say. But regardless, a lot of the poetry shines through. It's just that kind of story. We begin about a decade into the Trojan War when the greatest warrior of all, Achilles, has what I would term a justifiable temper tantrum and refuses to fight anymore for the leader of the Greeks, Agamemnon. And from the ripple effects of that falling out, we go on to many more glorious human and divine characters, gory battles, way more so than any movie version, and the most stunning observations about life. Lines that stopped my breath. Yeah, I much preferred the bedlam of this to the more streamlined narrative of the Odyssey. I need a word stronger than vivid to describe the experience of the Iliad. Um, so it is a commitment, let's be real, but one that's worthwhile, please. Number two is The Door by Magda Zabo, translated from Hungarian by Len Ricks. I don't know how to convey how eccentric and wonderful this novel is. I'd recommend it to so many readers regardless of their exact taste. If you're like me, and you've had tons of people telling you to read this book, it's because they care about you and want good things for you. So details. This follows the relationship between a writer, Magda, and her housekeeper, Emerence, who's the star of the show. And that's because the novel takes the form of Magda looking back on Emerence's place in her life and recognizing her significance after things have gone wrong. What struck me most about The Door was that Although it's mostly character studies, it has such emotional momentum and urgency. It's emotionally suspenseful almost in the way it shows two people gradually opening up to each other. There's commentary in here about how we all express love and care in different forms and how those qualities can be obscured in someone in the moment, even if they're obvious in hindsight. And Broadly, this is a story about the vulnerability of our trust in people, but mixed in with all that seriousness, it's incredibly funny and bizarre and memorable. Um, I need to stop at some point, so I'll arbitrarily choose now. And my favorite book of 2020 was Lila by Marilyn Robinson, Where to Begin. Um, when I read Home a few years ago, I called it something like subtlety on a grand scale, and this is that and beyond. It is beyond. Uh, Gilead, her more famous book, is narrated by a reverend who's dying. And in that, we get his perspective on his younger wife, Lila, um, whom he views as some kind of a rough around the edges miracle. She appeared in his church one day, clearly having faced a difficult life. And although Gilead is a remarkable book, um, to me, it's more remarkable to hear from Lila's perspective than from that of the Reverend John Ames. The Reverend is the kind of character who gets to speak more in fiction, generally. Lila has limited education and also limited experience of security, ease, happiness even. And so her views on basic things like family and home and God are so distinct. She has her own intellectual and emotional intelligence um, I couldn't believe how fully formed she arrived on the page. It's the kind of careful, imaginative empathy that I value most in fiction. I think it's the unassuming nature of this novel that moves me so much. Um, it's quiet dignity and thundering insight. You can absolutely read Lila on its own, but if you do read Gilead either before or after, I think you'll see what I mean about them capturing two largely parallel, but briefly 
intersecting lives. And it's now the name of this baby angel cloud muffin. So I'm not saying you have to like this book, just that if you don't, you're casting lateral aspersions on my cat. Who's a good girl? Who's a good little baby nugget? Who's so cute? Who's so cute? I'm insane. Thank you for watching me talk about my favorite books of my least favorite year. Let me know um, some recommendations from your 2020 reading below. Um, you can also talk about any of these that might interest you now. Of course, I'd love to hear about that, uh, along with any questions for the theoretical potential maybe Q&A. And um, I'll see you soon for another video. Bye, guys.